savior. Good guy. Um, love, compassion, um, diversity. An Easter, loving, bearded, kind. Got a good op opinion of Jesus Christ, that's for sure. An excellent man, wonderful. Sure, they had a religion after him. My savior. Actually, Jesus was the first punk rocker. Yeah? Yeah. He's, he's pretty cool, and I like him a lot. Savior. Black. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, I think it's good. Because uh, it's Jesus. What else would you think of? I'm um, definitely um, altruistic philanthropy. Loving, peaceful, sincere. Out of touch. Uh, hopeful. On their part, they're hoping for something they're not going to uh, get, I believe. Um, psycho, uneducated, backward, the South. I think of somebody that's possibly just a little bit, um, a little bit overboard, a little bit extreme. My Uncle Bob, um, conservative, white. Fanatical. Oh, okay. Bible thumpers. Crazy. <laughs> People who wear white and like kind of glow, but are kind of freaky. Okay. Yeah, and um, Texas. I think I think there's a lot of stig stigmas attached to that word. I can't answer that. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. Frightening. Yeah. Yeah. Almost. I just overpowering. Overpowering. Yeah. You don't want to know. Somewhat scary. Um, maybe a little rigid in their in their dogma and their philosophy. Oh, um, nothing too good. Today we will be reading from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly uh, pa passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and god godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. Well, and to purify, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The church that I grew up in did a lot of things right. For the most part, the people there were, um, were usually nice. They were supportive. People seem to you know, genuinely care about each other. We had programs on Sunday evenings and on Sunday mornings to engage different kinds of age groups and different kinds of people. We had a youth basketball team that played on Saturday, and we had a Wednesday night Awana program uh, as well. I, had, I also had really good Sunday school teachers who cared for me, um, who always seemed well prepared and made the Bible and the scriptures um, a priority in the curriculum. And the sermons every Sunday were usually powerful messages about the necessity of salvation, about personally making a decision for Jesus Christ and how to lead others to make that decision for themselves too. Like every single week, salvation was the main point. And I think that was right. I do, I think that was right because salvation is the main point. I mean, everything that we do should be about living out our salvation, right? About our relationship with Christ and how that empowers us to live the life that we're living now and also equips us for eternity, right? Making God look glorious 
Salvation is the point. It is the main point. And so, and so the question that I have for us today is, how is it that, that our salvation or the main event of a Christian's life so often produces Christians that are viewed so negatively or as crazy people? How does our salvation, our right relationship with Jesus, so often produce people who are viewed as being out of touch, overbearing, uneducated, hypocritical, and judgmental? Because that's not the way that people genuinely see Jesus, is it? The contrast in the video that we just watched is that right or wrong, for the most part, you know, people on the street really seemed to be okay with Jesus, didn't they? And the sermon series over Lent is encouraging us Christians to be more like Jesus or be like Jesus because we, we believe or we should believe that becoming like Jesus is at the heart of our Christian experience. Becoming like Jesus. And And please hear me, I'm not saying that those people on the video uh, were right in their opinions of Christians, nor am I saying they are correct, absolutely correct, in their opinions of Jesus. Because as I've said many times before, if people don't know the scriptures, you know, then all they can do is invent a Jesus of their own imaginations, based on their own assumptions of what Jesus, of who Jesus was and what he came to do. Because without the scriptures, without any real knowledge of the Jesus of the scriptures, we just kind of invented Jesus that we're comfortable with, which typically from the cultural perspective is a Jesus who's all peaceful and zen and nice and loving and who would never say anything to upset people. So I'm not saying that they're right. Nor am I saying that we should work harder to become the Christ of their imagination, just to feel more accepted. But I am saying that there is some truth to this. That there is often a great disconnect between the basic character of Jesus and the character of Christians who are called to be his body, his ambassadors and representatives to the world. And I think some of the, of the disconnect has, has occurred because of two reasons. One is the Christian's heightened sense of justice. Okay, because as Christians, we believe in sin don't we? We believe in sin. We believe it exists. We believe in in foundational concepts like right and wrong and good and evil. And we believe in a general sense that good deeds are to be honored and, and rewarded, while evil deeds are to be discouraged and possibly punished. Like that's really the glue that holds a society together, isn't it? Is a clear sense of justice that for society to function well, there needs to be a certain degree of consequence assigned to lawbreakers, to those who would break the law, so that evil doing, law breaking, and wrong behavior becomes discouraged. And that's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? Because like justice is just so natural. Well, that even kids get it, don't they? Like eye for an eye, you know, tooth for a tooth. You hit your sister, guess what? She's probably going to hit you back, right? That's justice, right? You take his toy, he's probably going to take your toy because you got what you deserved. And I think for, uh, like, I mean, many Christians like myself, who were trained up with a strong sense of God's divine justice, that sometimes we almost inadvertently become the morality police of society. 
Like we hold the line. Christians try to hold the line and uphold the moral law that God has ordained as good. And then we try to engage others with the reality of God's divine justice, don't we? We try to engage other people and warn them that if they continue down this path they're on in the direction that they're going, that God's wrath and God's justice is coming for them. We do that. And that's part of who we are. But here's where I think the the disconnect happens for people. You know, for the people who, who claim to really like Jesus, but claim to really not like Christians. Here's the disconnect. is I think Jesus wasn't the morality police. Or like he wasn't seen as the morality police. You know, what people know about Jesus is what? That he's the friend of sinners, right? He's the guy who ate and drank with crooks and prostitutes. He was always the guy hanging out with the lowest common denominator of society. And so right or wrong, when when Christians are seen as the morality police or acting in such a way as spiritually superior, inevitably we end up being hypocritical and from their perspective, trying to look all holier than thou. And when that happens, we lose our witness. Which leads me to my second reason. The second reason for this disconnect that people have between their perception of Jesus and their perception of Christians, I believe, is our often misappropriation of grace. And here's what I mean. The church that I grew up in, it talked a lot about justice. Like, like we talked a lot about sin and wrath and the need for salvation. But we didn't really talk a lot about grace. Like if I'm being honest, I don't even think I knew what grace was until probably my late 20s. Like, I don't ever really remember it being preached on, and it wasn't a term that often got dropped in my house, even though I know I received plenty of it. You know, to me, grace was just like a church word, like righteousness or, or sanctification or holiness. It was a word that got dropped into the Scripture passage that that was being preached, but for some reason it never really got unpacked. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit more about grace. What grace is exactly, and how as Christian followers, we are to be trained up in grace. Now grace by definition, is simply unmerited favor, okay? Grace is something given that cannot be earned because grace earned or grace worked for is not grace. It's compensation. It's payment. Now, why is that important for Christians to really understand? It's because if we don't understand grace then we all just become legalists. And when we deny the reality of grace, or when our faith becomes all about our ability to keep the law, which we will not do, okay, which no one will do to avoid receiving justice, or doing our best just to follow a long list of rules to earn God's favor, we forget why Christ came In the first place, verse 11 of our scripture passage for today says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And the grace of God who has appeared in this passage is Jesus Christ. He is the free gift that is offered to all. And he didn't come down to earth to reward the righteous and condemn the fallen. 
He came down to earth to bring salvation for all people because all people need to be saved. Because I mean, Paul tells us in Romans 3 that no one is righteous, not even one. No one does good. But because of this, because no one is righteous and because no one is good, God made a way for not good people to be saved. That was why in John 3.17 it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's why Paul told the Romans in Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christians are saved by God's grace alone. And Christians who forget that, as I said, they sadly forfeit their witness to the world. And they become like the Pharisees of Jesus's day, who, spiritually speaking, had it all together. They were law-abiding citizens who saw no such need for that kind of a Savior. But Christ came to save us and to train us. Okay, Paul tells Titus, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So Christ not only came to save us, but also to train us, which is odd for us. Because you might be thinking, just how exactly is grace a training agent? Right? Because, you know, We usually don't associate grace with action or grace with training, do we? I mean, training is usually more associated with discipline, isn't it? With endurance and hard work. We don't usually associate training with unmerited favor. We don't associate training with something freely given, I mean, training, if you've ever done anything, you know, like physically, it, it, it takes hard work. It takes practice, repetition, discipline, and perseverance, which is why grace, a free gift, is too often seen as weakness, while justice is seen as strength. Grace is often seen as something soft, while justice is seen as something hard, something absolute, something to be feared. Like you cross the line, boom, justice. But not in God's economy. In God's economy, it's always harder to show grace than it is to hold someone accountable, isn't it? In God's economy, it's always harder to forgive than it is to demand justice. In God's economy, it's always harder to show love to someone who has wronged you than it is just to write someone off. Trust me, friends, showing grace to people who don't reciprocate is a brutal business. Choosing to love someone unconditionally who hurts you or continually rejects you is one of the hardest things in the world to bear, and yet Christ has shown us that it can be done. Not only has he trained us by his example to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled godly lives for ourselves, he's trained us by his example to also show unmerited favor to others, not just our families, not just our friends, not just to people who like us, right? If we want to really bridge this gap and reconnect the the disconnect like between people's perception of Jesus and people's perception of Christians, 
we're going to have to show some unmerited favor to people who may seem very different from us. They're not really, but they may seem it. We're going to have to love people who have nothing to offer us in return. We're going to have to give as Jesus gave. And to do that, it's going to take a heck of a lot more than just good intentions. To truly glorify God and win our communities to Christ, it's going to take more than just trying harder or doing better. Because, you know, the last thing that most people need is another sermon encouraging them to do better and try harder. You know, because I tell you, trying harder isn't just going to cut it, right? Just trying harder is as doomed to fail now as it ever was, even in ancient Israel. It, if, if like we're going to really show the powerful, transforming love of God that we've experienced for ourselves, if we've experienced it in our own lives, if we're going to show that to the world around us, we're going to have to lean more heavily into God's grace. And we're going to need to become the conduit of that grace to a world full of sinners who, just like us, don't deserve it. Like Christ, we need to become a people who are zealous for good works. Okay? In this church, a people zealous to do good works, who are willing to be wronged, to become a people who are willing to put ourselves out there, maybe even be taken advantage of, but love anyway. If we're going to have any hope of you know, bridging this gap and reconnect that disconnect between the perception of Jesus and the perception of Christians, we need to stop trying and just start training. Because just trying harder for a test that you haven't studied for isn't going to work. And trying harder to win a game that you haven't practiced for won't lead you to victory, okay? Showing grace takes practice. Showing grace as an offensive strategy takes training that will exercise and probably really offend our sense of justice, okay? Because I've got a pretty strong sense of right and wrong. I got a pretty strong sense of justice. But guys, we have the best coach. We have the best teacher. And I'd like to personally grow more in grace this year. I'd like to see this church grow more in grace this year. I'd like us to become more known as a people who not only renounce ungodliness and worldly passions in our own lives, but who also are a tough people, who aren't afraid to eat with sinners, hang out with questionable folk like the pastor, hang out with people in our community, and I know, or like other people who other people ignore or look down their noses at. The church I grew up in did a lot of things right. Because God is just. Salvation is important. It is everything. But in Christ, God has shown us grace. And he has trained us up for such a time as this to be a people of grace. To be a people who do not go around demanding our own rights and demanding perfection, but to be a people who unconditionally love a world that does not deserve it. And he has given us the Holy Spirit that we may endure. We are equipped to do so, no matter how hard the world may be to love. Because, you know, many times before, many times before Jesus went to the cross, he told his disciples, what I'm doing now, you all understand. You all understand. But you will. And on the night he was betrayed, such a time occurred. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread on the beating of the 
the disciples and the other one. He took the bread and he gave thanks. And then he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, hey, this is my body which is broken for you. After the meal, he took the cup, he gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples to drink. He said, Hey, drink, this is the this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant which shed for you and for many and for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And then afterwards, he explained to them in a prayer. As he left the upper room with his disciples, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And on the way, he prayed this high priestly prayer in a way that they understood. And he said, He said, that God his Father was in him, as he was in his disciples. What better way to illustrate that than through you? We may not always understand how grace works. We don't have to. One day we will. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, I want to thank you for who you are, Lord, and that you always show us grace. Lord, grace upon grace. We don't deserve it. Lord, we have wronged you in so many ways. We have turned our back on our brothers. We have ignored those who need us. Father, we have been labeled as as judgmental and hypocritical. Father, the church is slandered today, and sometimes rightfully so. Lord, I know that breaks your heart. I pray today that you would help us, Lord, to become a people of love and a people of grace. A tough people like you were, like you are. Father, hear this last song. May it be an encouragement to us, and may your Holy Spirit work through it to bring yourself glory and honor in all the right ways. In Jesus' name, amen.